I am the president and CEO of United Way of East Central Iowa. I've been humbled to be in this position for almost a year now. And being a part of these equity conversations is very important to us at United Way. We are very thrilled to be a part of these conversations with the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission and the work that they do on a daily basis. If you don't know United Way, a simple way I explain it is, is we look at very big complex problems within our community. And then we use our connections, collaborations, convening skills to be able to bring different people around the table to have conversations, to be able to maybe come up with some creative solutions or at least be able to make systems and make progress in areas where those complex problems exist. And so being a part of this is something that we jumped at and said, yes, we wanna be a part of this. After the murder of George Floyd last year, both us as a local United Way and the United Way system as a whole took a real hard look as to what it means to be involved in DE&I in our communities. And as an entire United Way system, we actually voted to make stricter requirements for us. And we obviously voted yes immediately with that. But being a part of these conversations is something that we see as very valuable. We work at United Way to make sure our community is a place where everyone can succeed and everyone feels welcome. We just want to say thanks for you being here tonight. More than anything, we know that we are on our own journey as an organization, whether it's employees, which you'll see some other employees on tonight, and as well as us being a leader within the nonprofit world within Cedar Rapids. So we are thrilled to be a part of this, and we really hope that you understand the importance of you being here, because whether you take away one small nugget, a glimmer, a, a conversational tool, being able to hold that and then use it later on in our community will allow us all as a community to move forward. And so thank you for spending your time. We know 6.30 to eight o'clock on an evening on Tuesday, there are other things that are calling your time. So just thank you for being here. And we really hope that you just get one of those nuggets or glimmers tonight. Angelica, I'll throw it to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Stephanie will actually go through our guidelines for group discussion. Certainly. Um, as Kristen mentioned, we wanted to ensure that these conversations were focused on moving us towards a more equitable and just community. And that is the reason we focused on the title of creating a community of belonging. So belonging means more than just being seen or feeling included. It entails having a meaningful voice and the right to contribute to and make demands on society and on the community. So the Civil Rights Commission, we are thrilled to partner with the United Way of East Central Iowa for this series. And we look forward to partnering with you, community members, to help build a society in which everyone feels that they belong. So in order for us to have some, you know, a good conversation tonight and over the next um, several Eat nights, um, we have some tips for how we can have a good engaging conversation. So our commitment to you is to make sure that we're providing those opportunities for you to have a deep, um, important dialogue with us, um, understanding the stories and the narratives of people who might be different than you, have different experiences, have different identities. If we had, if you have anything you would like to say, please use the chat box. Um, you just go down to the very bottom of the screen and it'll say chat if you click on that. I know several folks have already used that. So some of our best conversations do happen there. So feel free to conversate, have a conversation in there. And if you do need to ask a question during the presentation or during the Q&A session, please use the raise your hand feature and a moderator will unmute you or you can type a question in the chat box. So this is one of, uh, this is a great quote. Several years ago, I gave um, a speech out at Mount Mercy and this was the focus of my, uh, my speech. So Angelica was excited to see this quote. It's, uh, education is the most powerful weapon, which you can use to change the world by Mandela. So as you said, uh, we've said Angelica and I are the moderators. Uh, presenters are John Tercy, Eric Thompson, and Dr. Ruth White. And we have asked that they um, self-introduce them and with their name, um, their role, um, how their work connects with equity and 
education. So feel free to um, start off for us, um, one of you three. I can call on one if you prefer. <laughs> Dr. White, will you start us off? Oops. You want me to say who I am and how my work intersects with equity and education or education yes. and equity? And okay, sure. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Stephanie and Angelica. My name is Ruth White. I am founder and executive director of the Academy for Scholastic and Personal Success. And I also serve as chair of the Cedar Rapids Civil Rights Commission. Um, I've been involved in equity work for as long as I can remember. I've taught for 23 years at Washington High School where I served as academic advisor to minority students. And in that role, um, tracked and uh, encouraged and diverted students onto paths and trajectories that were going to serve them well. Um, outside, well, I was going to say outside of education, um, I do a lot of things, but I don't think there is anything outside of education because I do believe uh, in my soul of soul and heart of hearts that education is the key to all of our, our <laughs> issues. And I'll probably be um, going on a little bit about that when my turn comes to present. So uh, in, with the Academy, uh, we do focus on students of color, read black, brown, and biracial. And we give them a rigorous academic experience along with cultural information, believing that as the research shows that students who know who they are have a better chance of success, both academic and uh, personal, hence the name of the organization. Uh, this is an organization that's 31 years old and we have across paths with thousands of young people. Um, and I really think, and, and uh, I think that this is a point of, of pride, I can count on one hand the number of students who have run afoul of the system. So whatever we're doing, I think we, we're, we're doing something right. So um, uh, Eric Thompson is the director of the Academy and we work uh, together a lot. Um, I've I work with Stephanie uh, all the time, and I probably work with some of you who are, are in our audience this evening. So thank you for having me. I look forward to sharing uh, with you my take on education and educational equity. Um, we, are, we are based in Cedar Rapids. We, in, we recruit students from the Cedar Rapids Community School District and the adjacent districts. Um, primarily Prairie, not so much Linmar at this point. Um, we are in the planning mode, I don't know if I should say this out loud, uh, to expand to Iowa City. Uh, we should be everywhere, but, uh, but we're here. So thank you for that question. I'll take other questions when it's my turn. So Stephanie. Great, thank you so much, Dr. White. I always appreciate hearing the work you're doing. And like you said, I get to work with you quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Eric Thompson, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, thanks, Stephanie. Thank uh, you. As Dr. White mentioned, I serve as director for the Academy for Scholastic and Personal Success. This will be uh, this summer, my sixth summer as a part of this organization. Uh, in addition, I'm a certified uh, master educator, uh, certified in fifth grade through 12th grade, uh, receiving that certification at Teachers College, Columbia University. Uh, I started my teaching career in New York State and moved to Iowa and have continued that. At present, I am in the second year of a PhD program at the University of Iowa in the Educational Policy and Leadership Studies department focusing on schools, culture, and society, and serve as the national senior representative for Division F, which is history and historiography for the American Education Research Association. Uh, my research uh, and what I will hope to write uh, many essays and papers and books on is primarily the education in public school and the ascension into higher education uh, for students 
that are particularly biracial with a black parent and a white parent. I'm very specific about that because I am one of them. Uh, I also have a history degree from Northeastern University and a jazz performance degree from New England Conservatory of Music. So suffice it to say, uh, everything that I do as a human deals in facts and absolute. A quarter note equals one. It never equals anything else unless there's a dot next to it. And uh, in my mini presentation, uh, we'll quickly learn if we haven't already that facts are stubborn things. And I live in the world of reality, what is and what was and what hopefully uh, can be. And it is an honor to be a part of this uh, four week uh, conversation. Stephanie. Thank you so much, Eric. And again, another person I love listening to and I'm really excited to hear what you're gonna to bring to the table tonight. So thank you. John, could you please share about you? And you were actually the first up for having your um, sharing. So if you'd like to just you know, tell us what about yourself and then maybe move right into your um, speaking if that works for you. Absolutely. I, I'm the third leg of this uh, stool and I'm probably the one that's a wobbly one compared to these two. So what I hope to do is set them up and give some good information. Uh, my name is John Tercey. I've been the executive director of the Boys and Girls Club since 1998. Uh, I was a teacher and a coach before I started uh, at the Boys and Girls Club, uh, I've got a little bit of education in my background history. My dad taught out at Prairie High School for 38 some odd years. My mom taught for a few years. My younger brother, Jim, taught for like 10 years. And my wife is a science teacher at Marion High School right now. So uh, it, like with these two, I am the one that's not the smartest one in the whole group. So um, what I hope to do for you today is give you some, uh, I'm like Eric, I wanna give you some facts. Um, I'm a big person about asking questions and uh, providing uh, some insight. And then I'm gonna tell you at the very end, what I see is something that I think the Boys and Girls Club can do. So Boys and Girls Club, we serve on a normal non-COVID year, about 300 kids a day, 330. Uh, if you include Iowa City, we are now in Cedar Rapids, uh, we are in Marion, and we are in Iowa City, so we made the change to the Boys and Girls Club of the Corridor. Uh, about 70% of our kids are from some type of minority family, so we predominantly serve minority kids. We are in um, economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, so 95% of the kids that come to us come from a poverty level to just set the stage that um, equity to me is, is getting to everybody and everything that we possibly can. And, and we do in our uh, mission statement state, uh, those that need us the most. And I think that uh, can be any kit in any situation, but the reality is um, right now today, as we look at things, um, the kids that we serve and, and Dr. Ruth White and Eric are doing are, are the same uh, breed of kids that need the most help. So let's just talk about this. First thing I, I want to state is, obviously this is a problem. When we talk about equity, it, it's a problem because we know that, and, and I'm gonna hopefully give you some statistics. But as we look at this, I'm gonna ask you to do one of two things. I tell my staff this and they would laugh if they heard me telling this. There are two types of people in the world in dealing with problems, problem causers or problem solvers. You decide what you wanna be and when you wanna be it because that's really what it comes down to. And when you're being a problem solver, the one thing that I always suggest to them is first, take a deep breath and count to 10. Most of the situations our staff deal with on a daily basis are pretty high wire acts and, and things are raised up. So just take a second, relax and, and get your thoughts and come up with two solutions. Because your first one is usually your gut solution. Your second one is, now I had to think about it because now I'm thinking about what's the second thing I would do because the first thing I want to do, now I got to really sit back and think. So all I'm asking you tonight is if we're really going to make change, we need problem solvers. And problem solvers have to think because it's more than just one thing. It's several different things and we all know that. So all I'm asking you to do is first of all, be a problem solver. So I'm going to give you a bunch of questions and, and ask some questions and, and uh, Angelica, I don't know if I'm, you want me to just keep going or give them a little time. 
but I, I'm going to ask these questions because I believe that uh, it, it is based in fact. And there's a lot of things that if we really understand it, it leads us to the uh, answer that we really know is what we need to do. I do want to give some real props too to the United Way. They've done a lot of work on education and, and it started a long time ago. And when I was doing this presentation, I did ask Angelica and Ryan and they gave me some good statistics to go by just to back up what I thought I heard. Um, I've been a part of the United Way ever since I started in 98. And I will tell you, uh, I think they do a great job of trying to get us down a course and path to look at how we can make real change. So first thing that years ago, they started asking this question. And I, and I love to ask this question when I'm starting off a conversation about this. Do you know what statistic the US government uses to predict the number of jails they're gonna build in the future? Think about that. What's the statistic they use to do that, right? It's simple, high school graduation rates. Why is it high school graduation rates? Well, statistics show that students that don't graduate are two to three times more likely to commit a crime and go to jail. Simple, right? Now, the one thing that research has done for us is proven that there's actually a precursor to that statistic that we can predict the number of kids that may not graduate from high school. Does anybody know what that is? You see, somebody made a good guess. It's third grade reading proficiency. So if a child is not reading proficient by third grade, the likelihood that they are not gonna graduate from high school exponentially grows. And I, I think if I remember the statistic, it was like two to three times greater. So think about those two things right now. Now I'm gonna ask you a few questions right now and, and how it's broken up is white and non-white students, okay? So when we're talking about this, I'm asking you about non-white uh, non and white students. Do you know what the high school demographic breakup for high school students in Lynn County is? Given a few, I like this. You know, I told you I was a teacher, right? You know, the teacher trick they teach you is you're supposed to count to let people think. And when they look away, you know, you're supposed to call on them because they really don't know the answer. Fortunately for you, you don't have to worry about that tonight. But the, the statistic that I got from Angelica and Ryan was that in Lynn County, 20% are non-white students and 80% are white students. That would seem to make sense, right? It's not really hard. Think about our city and the county we live in. That probably seems very reasonable. Now, the next question I asked them to look up for, I mean, I was fine at two, but I just wanted to make sure what I had was, what percentage of those kids that don't graduate, don't graduate from Lynn County, okay? What percentage of those kids, so let's just say there's 100 kids, which we know there are more than that, but just for simple math, of the 100 kids that don't graduate, what percentage of those kids are non-white and what percentage of those kids are white? Okay, statistically speaking, 31% of the kids that don't graduate are non-white. 69% of the kids that don't graduate are white. Okay, so starting to build this, does that make sense? Well, if 80% of your whole population is white, then probably from a statistical number, the percentage of kids are gonna be higher. So we know we have to dig in a little bit deeper, right? We gotta really dive into this and say, well, what are we trying to do? So when we compare the total number of non-white students and the number of non-white students that don't graduate compared to the number of white students and non-white students that don't graduate, the statistic jumps dramatically different. 20%, one in five of all non-white students in Lynn County don't graduate. 20%, one in five. 9%, one in 10 white students in Lynn County 
don't graduate. That's twice as many. You can say what you want, but when you start looking at the numbers, that tells us that there is clearly a disparity that needs to be addressed. Okay, now, why are those statistics so important? Well, I already told you that kids that don't graduate are two to three times more likely to commit crime. I went on and found this from the Iowa Department of Corrections. Uh, those kids that are incarcerated right now, the education levels, 22% of those incarcerated have 11th grade or below education level. 42% have a high set or a GED. 31% have a high school diploma and 5% have post-secondary education. So if you break it up to what I said, high school graduation being the deal, that's 36% that are incarcerated as compared to, if I'm doing my math right, 64% that are incarcerated, that's the two thirds. Why am I telling that? I'm just trying to, to, to give you some information so that as we talk about this, and as my two colleagues who are gonna do a much better job than I am, I just wanted you to see there are facts, as Eric said, that lead us to know that there is a disparity that we need to deal with. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with more statistics, folks, but if you go and look at, uh, people that are incarcerated by white and non-white, you know what it's gonna do? It's gonna reflect the statistics I just showed you. It's gonna show you that yes, there are more whites that are, can, that are incarcerated, but when you look at the percentage compared to the population, it's far greater in inequity. So what am I trying to set you up for? Well, I told you I want you to be problem solvers, right? So I want you to start to think about how you are gonna help our community. How are you gonna help move the needle, okay? Here's what I have, okay? I broke it down to three things that I'm very passionate about. The first thing is we need every kid to be school ready. We know, again, disproportionately speaking, that kids of minority, kids in poverty are coming to school not ready for school. Now, I gotta give some props to people. Um, I believe one of the most important things we can do is get kid books in kids' hands before they're ready for school. We have great agencies like YPN and HACAP um, and Waypoint that are doing things like Head Start and getting kids school stuff and materials and parents of young, young parents, the information they need. So that's a great thing. Um, the second thing that I think is really important when they get to school, now we, I'll let Dr. White and Eric talk about some of that stuff, but here's some of the things that I know. Kids need food, they need food. Folks, I've ran the club since 98 and I'm gonna tell you this, you're probably all gonna think I'm a mean person. Hungry kids suck. And you know what? It's just not appropriate. No kid should be hungry. Shouldn't happen. Not where we live. But I will tell you anytime, and this used to happen a lot more when I first started, um, we'd be open from 8.30 to 5.30 during the summer, and we didn't have a food program at that time, and I would have kids come to our club with a dollar. They'd buy a bag of chips and a candy bar, and that was supposed to last them for the day. Do you think we weren't having anarchy everywhere? Of course we were. Kids are hungry. They don't, they don't do things when they're hungry. They act out. They, you know, you know it. You know what I'm talking about. So my point is, is we got to make sure kids are getting food. Now, again, we got to give props. Our Cedar Rapids School District and all the food pantries and things they did with this pandemic was amazing. It shows us we can take care of getting kids foods. And so that's really important to me. Mental health issues. Folks, we gotta get past the stigma that mental health's a bad thing. It's not, I mean, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but maybe I just lived in a great family and everything else. I think the uh, issues that are facing our youth today are far greater than issues that I ever saw when I was a kid. I mean, just from the, the ability to have technology and everything else that gets you answers that you shouldn't know immediately um, scares me. Fortunately for us, we have great organizations like Tanager Place and Abbey and Four Oaks that are doing great things for our kids in schools. But I will tell you, several years ago, when they started cutting money from mental health, I knew it was gonna happen and we reap what we sow and that's what we've gotten. So I, I really think we need more than that. 
the last thing I see from in school, other than a lot of stuff, I'm, a, I'm an active person, as you can tell, I'm an Italian, I'm raising my hands talking. One of the things I like to see is more STEM activities, more get up and move activities in school. I think schools are trying to do that as much as possible. They're finally, you know, they're really coming around. There's a long way to go, but I think that's, that's really important. The last thing I'll tell you is this, folks, and this is what I think where the Boys and Girls Club comes in. I think we're waiting far too long to show kids opportunity. That's my biggest push right now. Um, we have a Marion unit, it's called our Career Academy. The whole goal of our Career Academy in Marion is it's fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. By the time, and obviously this year put us off, but by the time they leave me, if they start with us in fifth grade, our goal is going to be show them 40 different companies within Cedar Rapids that are all great companies, great paying companies that have jobs. But the most important thing you have to do is graduate from high school. So our goal is to show kids opportunity. Growing up on the Southeast side of Cedar Rapids when I was a kid, the one thing I know is I didn't know what General Mills did. I didn't know what a law office was. I mean, I just didn't know those things. So part of our deal is we have to give kids and show kids opportunities so they have a reason to graduate from high school. And I think it starts earlier. I think it starts in middle school before they get to high school so that they see there's something for them. Their future is the most important thing. So those are kind of my little things that I have. Um, Angelica, I think I'm done. And I will mute myself unless I'm supposed to answer questions now or later. Uh, we'll actually allow for the open Q&A after we've had each of our presenters. Um, but if anybody does have any questions, you can certainly pose those in the chat box and we can address those at a later time. Um, Eric, would you like to um, take it away? Sure. Uh, I hope during this brief spin that the camera doesn't freeze or my face doesn't freeze in mid blink or mid word uh, or cut off a word and it sounds like I might be cursing, which isn't true. Um, I'm going to share uh, my screen um, because I would like you to actually see what is being said in addition to uh, hearing what is what I'm saying. Um, and so what I have decided uh, to uh, call this evening's mini presentation, and it's on the other side here, uh, is uh, as it loads, uh, American public education, facts are stubborn things. And I, I choose the big, those first four words that at the time lawyer John Adams spoke in his closing argument in defense of the British soldiers. You may have learned this in school as the Boston Massacre. And the second president of the United States and America's first vice president under the constitution served as their defense attorney uh, because his cousin, Samuel Adams, in addition to many of his Bostonian friends and coworkers, uh, uh, local business people, knew that John was of, of strong stature, a, uh, an ardent believer in his religion, in his wife, Abigail, and his children, uh, and in the idea of America. Uh, and I have decided to uh, title the second uh, 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 slide, the rest of his statement, whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passion, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. And I don't want to assume uh, Anybody on this conversation feels one way or the other. The greatest thing about trying to be a musician and trying to teach people how to play drums and cymbals a little bit better, and in an attempt to inform uh, secondary students, whether they be middle school or high school, uh, of the history of this country, to say nothing about those with whom I teach and work at the University of Iowa, uh, soon to be certified educators, uh, 
the greatest thing about music and history is that unless Men in Black becomes a real, r- realistic thing, and those mind wipe uh, buttons actually do exist, or a flux capacitor is created from the Back to the Future movies, the past cannot be altered. And facts are what they are. And what is the reality of them is that facts upset people. And people get upset when they hear things they don't like, generally speaking. Uh, And since our time, myself and Dr. White, is about education, uh, I will begin with one myth. Uh, And I am not trying to destroy anybody's view of what they perceive America to be. But you see this on bumper stickers, T-shirts. You see it smeared across flags, which is a violation of U.S. code, but we won't go down that road. Land of the free and at the end of that bumper sticker, and you may have it on your car. Your family may have it because of the brave. I don't doubt that some of that is true for you and your family or friends. But the foundation beginning in 1607 and then rearing its head again in 1619 The fact is land of the free, not true for black, brown and biracial Americans. And for the duration of this one slide, I've used three Bs, black, brown, biracial. Uh, The foundation of American education is the concept of republicanism, which binds first and second generation European colonists, European separatists together with the concept of virtue. pre-war for independence. You have colonial schools, the common school, you have uh, 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 parochial and farm schools and many young people on this continent that are of European descent were taught at home mainly by their mother and the second tier was the religious institution wherever it may be. And at that time, the irony of leaving Europe was for freedom of religion. And then Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams are expelled from Massachusetts Bay for voluntarily choosing to pray to whom they wanted. Therein lies the foundation of Rhode Island and the capital of Providence. Black, brown and biracial Americans, or I should say enslaved West Coast Africans are excluded from the concept of virtue and Republicanism because of enslavement and what started out as indentured servitude for European separatists paying for their other brethren and sisterin from Europe to come to the new world as it were, when that became too expensive, the idea was let's go take West Coast Africans. And I would be remiss if I did not say Africans were sold by their own people into bondage, but they were also stolen. You've heard of the Atlantic, and this word is history's word, not mine, the Atlantic slave trade. They are human beings. The Atlantic human trade, the Columbian exchange. There's a concept there that many who believe that Robert E. Lee will rear his head again and come out of the ground, that the American Civil War wasn't fought to keep the institution of enslavement. But I say this, I ask you this question. The production of cotton in the Southern United States handpicked by enslaved black Americans. And then with the cotton gin, it makes for the advent of easier production. Yet those who owned black Americans, I'm going to paint two pictures with one brush. I'm going to have a labor force that I do not have to pay and I'll make money by what they cultivate for me. One of the greatest educators that I ever have come into contact with put me on the path that I'm about to share. Dr. Francis McMahon told me to understand American history, you must understand economics. And if you understand economics, you understand history. He couldn't be more right if he had created money. We move on from six, and I realize this is, this is very broad stroke. 1647 until 1865, which includes the war for independence, or at least colonial uh, uh, white independence, 
all the way through the American Civil War. Black, brown, and biracial Americans, and I do use that word, that's me. They are first generation, there are first generation black and brown and biracial human beings on this continent. In addition to Native Americans, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Pequot, just to name four, Seminole to name five, were banned from the institution of American public schools. The war for independence created movement to uh, the, you know, the uh, single digit amount of metropolitan cities. But as the colonies expand, you see Southern and Eastern migrants from Europe. Enslavement is still uh, 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 running uh, all wheels, fifth gear, and black Americans, brown and biracial are kept out in addition to Native Americans from public schools and learning happened at night or in very, very small controlled settings. 1865, 1868, 1870. These three years are important because these are when the Reconstruction Amendments were handed down. In 1865, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolishes slavery and all, and all involuntary servitude. 1868, the 14th Amendment, any human born or naturalized on this continent is a citizen of this country. And 1870, citizens of this country granted the right to vote. From 1865 until uh, 1876, that's the Reconstruction Era, and one of the greatest minds of our time, Professor Eric Foner at Columbia, wrote the book. It's literally called Reconstruction. And I will say this. I asked from January of 2017 through last week, I need one of you in a red hat to tell me when that MAGA word that you've created and believe in, when did that happen? And I'll say this, the quote, radical Republicans, unquote, right here in the 18th, uh, 19th century, this is when you see these reconstruction amendments, slavery abolished, right to vote, citizenship, the enforcement acts to protect recently freed black Americans. The Freedmen's Bureau also helps those lay destitute after the Civil War, which means impoverished white Americans are protected by the quote radical Republicans. But in 1876, you have an election, Rutherford B. Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel Tilden which results in the Compromise of 1877. Tilden would not, then this may sound familiar. I don't know if you'll recognize what I'm about to say. Tilden refused to accept the outcome of the election. I know you've never heard that phrase before. And so he and Hayes are battling for the popular and electoral vote. The, 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 the gap is very small. And Tilden says, I'll do you one, Rutherford. If you remove the Union troops from the five military districts of the former Confederacy that are protecting freed black Americans and the destitute, I will relinquish, no longer fight, you'll be president. Hayes says, you got it. And the Compromise of 1877 systematically crushes inclusion, equity, and equality. Meet Jim Crow, a caricature from minstrel shows, which is why going as Brown, uh, going in blackface, you probably don't want to do that this year for Halloween. I, I, I wouldn't do it if I were you. So effectively, from 1877 until 1954, this country, which is the land of the free and the home of the brave, all men are created equal with certain unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The United States, in conjunction with SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, Segregation re-emerges after a brief uh, 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 pause. And the case of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 makes segregation separate but equal constitutional. You hear me? The United States Supreme Court decided that as long as it's segregated, provided there is equal, uh, there are equal attributes and equity, it's fine. Hey, there's a school. There's a desk. You said they need to have desks. There are a couple. Post-World War II, you are introduced to what is known as white flight. There are many people with whom I've spoken that refuse to accept this. 
at the conclusion of the Second World War, much like the conclusion of the first, when Black Americans serving this country who were citizens, but being pre-redlined before redlining happens in large quantities after World War II, when coming back from defeating Nazis have to enter through the back door of restaurants, movie theaters, and public establishments after saving the world from Nazis. And when black Americans move into cities, Manhattan, Chicago, Detroit, you see what is known as white flight, a synonymous town, one I pass through every day to work, Levittown on Long Island, purposefully built to keep blacks out. Schools, lots of money without black Americans. The city of Chicago tried to integrate its schools in 1954. And the United States thinks it's a good idea now to provide equal and equitable education for all of its citizens. Brown versus Board of Education and then Brown II a year later will change uh, the face of education. Some believe, some believe, well, with Brown versus Board, look, now everybody can go to school and everything is going to be equal. But I push back when you've got hundreds and hundreds of years of segregation lack of equity, lack of equality, poor environment, poor health code, poor social uh, uh, welfare programs. And now you say, come on in, everybody all skate. That wasn't going to work. You can legislate, but you cannot legislate hate. Brown versus Board of Education overturned Plessy versus Ferguson. And why there was a second decision a year later is because in Brown 2, the court has to articulate with all deliberate speed, which means school districts strewn throughout the United States that were still segregated had to move with all deliberate speed. But what SCOTUS didn't do was specify how fast that speed should be. The Chicago Defender, May 18th, 1954. Neither the atom bomb nor the hydrogen bomb will ever be as meaningful to our democracy as the unanimous declaration of the Supreme Court that racial segregation violates the spirit and the letter of our constitution. Beautiful, beautiful words. I would think people would agree with that. But then you get Jackson, Mississippi, the Mississippi Daily News, the same day, blood stains on marble white steps. Quote, human blood may stain Southern soil in many places because of this decision, but the dark red stains of that blood will be on the marble steps of the United States Supreme Court building. White and Negro children in the same schools will lead to miscegenation. Miscegenation leads to mixed marriages and mixed marriages lead to mongrelization of the human race. That's 1954. Violence on the steps of Supreme Court. Violence in Washington, D.C., that never happens. By the time Eisenhower is on his way out, the Civil Rights Act of 1957 is written. And what the Civil Rights Act of 1957, it's the first federal civil rights piece of legislation passed by the United States Congress since the Civil Rights Act of 1865. You have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. You may be thinking, I thought we solved this. Yeah, we didn't solve that. That wasn't solved. Uh, you've got the Elementary and Secondary Act, which is signed uh, uh, by uh, Lyndon Johnson. Additional attempts to create equity and equality through the elementary and secondary school systems in the United States. The Higher Education Act of 1965, signed on November 8th, it was a part of this large Great Society program by President Johnson. It was a federal law that governed that administration of federal higher education programs. And the purpose was to strengthen educational resources. In short, we'll take your money away from you if you do not integrate. You enter then the city of Chicago who would regularly get their uh, monies stifled. Dion Dance has written a fantastic book about the desegregation of Chicago public schools. 
And this last point, uh, prior to the latter half of the uh, into the 21st century, Milliken v. Bradley. This states, the Supreme Court overturned lower court decisions holding that school districts were not obligated to desegregate unless it had been proven that the lines were drawn with racist intent on the part of the districts. In short, hey, you just told me Bigfoot doesn't exist. You have to prove to me that Bigfoot doesn't exist. Okay, I, I, I hope the, the theme has, has maybe started to take hold. No child left behind. From 2002 through 2015, the law held that schools were accountable for how kids learned and achieved. And then, then came uh, uh, the uh, uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, the nation's main education law, which doubled down uh, on the Elementary and Secondary Act of 1965. What I'm saying, if I'm saying nothing, is this at the tail end of this. This country has never truly gone forward to try to create equal or equitable education for any of its citizens, primarily black or brown or biracial. And we are still dealing with the effects of Supreme Court decisions, of the Great Society, of the New Deal, of the Fair Deal. And what Dr. White and I are trying to do in public education is with the lack of social capital, with the lack of human capital, with the forms of capital that many with whom we work possess. They enter already labeled. They enter already stigmatized. Their master status, the moment they step out of the house, that's not just a boy or a girl, that's a black boy or a black girl. They're already labeled. And what we are trying to do is, yes, the history of this nation, yeah, it's awful. And we had a previous administration saying, you cannot teach the 1619 Project, because that's liberal propaganda. Okay, telling the truth about why my ancestors were brought here is not propaganda. My father and my mother raised me better than that. I was born at night, but not last night. And what Dr. White and I are hoping to do, along with anybody willing to do it, is to stare public educators and public education in the face. Do not label these young boys and girls. Do not label these young kings and queens, they can wear that hoodie if they want. They can speak the way they want. They're already labeled. This country has fought too long and too hard to try to level or to segregate, to redline, to demean, to defame. And what we are trying to do at the academy is to I'll draw my last breath is to make sure that they can go into that classroom and then if they choose to go to college, they can select from a list. And if they choose not to, that's their right as well. Stephanie. Thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate the historical reminder um, that many of these events were in our lifetimes and continuing, continuing on today. So thank you, Eric. Dr. White, you are next. Well, how do you follow Eric Thompson? <laughs> we are, um, we are a good a good uh, pair. He and I are a good pair, and because he's the historian and I'm the literarian, but we both uh, are teaching the same thing, which is that this country has never been the land of the free and the home of the brave. You know, I grew up in a town where we were the only black people, and I did not learn that uh, that this is not the land of the free and the home of the brave until. I was a grown adult. And uh, Eric talks about being in the PhD program. I was in a PhD program too, but I was in a PhD program because and solely because I was looking for myself and all through my high school um, and uh, college career at which I did well because my parents raised me well, um, I didn't see myself. I did not see myself at all. I saw Mark Twain talk about black people and I saw um, William Faulkner talk about black people and I learned about Mark Twain and I learned about William Faulkner, but I didn't learn about anybody who was black. 
until I got to the University of Iowa and uh, entered a PhD program in American studies with an emphasis in African American history and literature. And that was an awakening, that was an epiphany, that was my aha moment because I said, oh, I knew we were around, I knew we had done great things, I had two parents who told me that, but I didn't see it in my education. So um, my, my title is, Who Wears the Mask? When I saw what I saw on January 6th, I thought, who are these people? And when I discovered that many of those people whom I would have just called hooligans or rednecks or some you know, derogatory term for the unwashed masses and unschooled white people, when I saw them and realized that they were professionals. Some of them were elected officials. Some of them were Olympians. Some of them were uh, public servants. I again said, who are these people? They are presenting themselves as upstanding citizens by my definition, but they are not. They are rotten to the core, they are rotten in their souls, and they have unmasked themselves. So who are they really? I then began to wonder whether or not the people that I come into contact with are wearing masks, masks themselves. And then I began to wonder Who's in our schools? I wonder if any of these masked men, who is that masked man, are teaching our children. And I would, I would, with great sadness, but what great belief, after having seen what I saw, say, yeah, there are some people like those hooligans in our schools. I think there are. And that's a problem. Because how do we know? Uh, how, do, how do we know whether or not the teacher in front of the classroom is wearing a mask and then voting for somebody who would take away my rights or who would uh, separate children from their parents or would do any of the other kind of heinous things that have been done but in the last administration? So when I thought about that, I thought about this poem called Who we-, we Wear the Mask. Does anybody know who this is? I can't have you raise your hands, golly. Um, so I'll just tell you, this is Paul Lawrence Dunbar. All through my elementary, high school, college education, until I got to graduate school, I did not learn about Paul Lawrence Dunbar. My grandmother recited Paul Lawrence Dunbar to us when we were children, and that's how I know his name. Paul Lawrence Dunbar wrote a poem called We Wear the Mask. It's about how Black people could not be themselves, that they had to wear a mask in white society. Now, I'm going to to share with you a, a little bit about how we can help our students understand the value of our heritage. And it's not just black kids who need to understand the value of our heritage. Everyone needs to understand the value of our heritage. Because in in an upcoming PBS um, documentary on the black church, uh, one of the promos, the lines in the promo says, they've been trying to kill us ever since we got here and we're still here. So that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're up against. So Paul Lawrence Dunbar in 1896, that's a date that you've heard before just a few minutes ago, um, wrote this poem. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Now that's what I thought 
when I saw that guy with the horns climbing up the side of the Capitol. Invert that stanza and apply it to the white person who is wearing the mask that grins and lies. Paul Ernst Dunbar wrote this about his people, our people, my people, because we, in that period of time that Eric talked about just a few minutes ago called Jim Crow, radical reconstruction, had to wear a facade, had to, to pretend. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from so tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile, but let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. So when I teach um, literature, I talk, particular American literature, I talk about this country by teaching the vocabulary word dichotomy because we are opposites occupying the same space. Is this a, a country that is magnificent? Yes, absolutely. Would I wanna live anyplace else? I don't think so. But do we have uh, an ugly history? Yes, we do. So why not, if we are truly interested in educating ourselves, our children, why not confront those ugly wounds so that we can move on? Because, you know, we've never had that conversation as a country. We have never had the conversation about what the history of this country really is. All of the facts that Eric uh, presented to you are true and real. But I don't know how many of you, and I kind of scanned the, the audience, would have read or learned about these things in your elementary, middle, or high school classes. And if you did not read about these things or learn about these things or discuss these things or do what everybody loves to do in terms of projects about these things, if you did not do that, and you are now an adult operating in, the, in society, then you are operating at less than full strength because you do not have the background, the platform that you need in order to operate at full strength. And I hope that's, that's clear because we can't do this work coming in laterally. We can't do this work coming in from the side. We have to start at the beginning, which means we have to start where Eric talked about starting. We have to start with the way we got here, the reason we got here, what we were used for, what we have done, what we have, how we have been put upon, um, on and on and on through the history until now. Because if we do not start at the beginning and learn our history and do that work, then we will continually make the same mistakes. And I'm old enough to have seen us go around this barn about three times. And so here we are again. You know, um, I, 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 don't, I don't do history the way Eric does at all. I can remember, however, my history classes where we had to learn dates and, and um, memorize the, the, um, the order of presidents and what dates they, they, uh, were, they were in office. That's what we, that was, was our history lesson. Um, so I don't, I don't learn history that, I didn't learn history that way, which is why I appreciate being in Eric's wake so often because he gives us that, that understanding. But unless we start at the beginning, unless we start at the bottom, then we're not gonna be able to do this work. And I have seen um, our school district, which is in better shape than it's been in 
for a long time, in my humble opinion, um, in terms of its response to the situation, the plight, the needs of students of color. Um, unless we start at the bottom, then we will be making the same mistakes that we've made before. Now, John cited some statistics regarding a uh, number of, st of students that uh, the government looks at in order to uh, determine how many prisons they're going to build. If we looked behind that, or if you read Michelle Alexander's uh, book on the school to prison pipeline, you will open your mouth and not be able to get it closed. Because again, as Eric said, if you know about economics, you'll know about history. You'll see the rationale. Why are, have prisons been privatized? Why, is, why in Iowa is the prison population 25% Black when Black people are only 3 to 5% of the population? So there you go. And yes, absolutely, Mr. Kern, you must read uh, Ma uh, Ma Cast. And you must read The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. And I have a little um, um, book list that I can leave with you. But I will repeat, we have to start at the beginning. Oh, what I was going to say about the district is that we have watched them contract with, with um, uh, organizations, uh, uh, companies, over and over again, who come in from the outside and purport to change the way that uh, minority students perform, and it has never worked. It has never worked because it's a lateral move. It's a lateral move because it presumes to understand what's going on now without having done the work to understand what has gone on and how all of those things are linked together. So uh, that's, that's, that's my message. We have to start at the bottom. We have to start at the beginning. You have to know the history of this country. So there was a, somebody just wrote a message that said, I've never heard of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Okay, shame. Everybody should, have, should know Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Paul, Paul Lawrence Dunbar should hold the same level um, in our English language arts classes as Robert Frost. I, I love Robert Frost. I taught Robert Frost. I can recite to you Robert Frost. I can also recite to you Paul Lawrence Dunbar, but you don't know who he is. And that's kind of an unequal um, equation there. Now, what my mother, my grandmother used to recite to us was Paul Lawrence Dunbar as well, but it was in dialect, um, a poem called Little Brown Baby. And I'm going to give you a little bit of it because I love to recite poetry and throw this, this in whenever I make a presentation. Little brown baby. Little brown baby with sparkling eyes, come to your pappy and sit on his knee. What you been doing, sir? Making sand pies? Look at that bib. He's as dirty as me. Look at that mouth. That's molasses, I bet. Come here, Mariah, and wipe off his hands. B is going to catch you and eat you up yet, being so sticky and sweet. Goodness lands. And that's the first stanza of many, several, uh, nine, I think, stanzas of that poem, which is a poem about a father's love for his child. It is written in dialect. So do we have that to teach our young people? No, we do not. I heard, um, um, an interview with Cecily Tyson, may she rest in peace, that said that when she um, was uh, in Sounder, someone came to her and said he had to admit that he was prejudiced. And she said, why? And he said, because of the relationship between the boy and the father. And he, he called his father daddy. And she said, do you have children? And she, he said, yes. And she said, what do your children call you? And he said, daddy. And she said, I realized at that moment that he didn't see us as people. He didn't see us as human beings. Now, 
I recommend that you look up this poem and read it yourself, but I t will tell you with a certainty that the reason you don't know about this poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, if you know about the other one, which I guess maybe some of you don't, is that it's written in dialect, which is seen as less than, even though everybody who is was a junior in high school ever in life read the dialect that Mark Twain wrote, about black people, even though he was not a black people. And because this is a poem that, sh that depicts a black man, a black father in a loving relationship with his child, his toddler child. And people for a long time, even up till now, I would hasten to add or do not believe that the relationship between black men and children or black families is the same as it is among white families. Now, I say that and then I flash back to the people climbing up the side of the Capitol building and think, I wonder if those people think that about me. And I wonder if there are any people in our schools who think that about me, who are teaching our children. So um, I, I have just one other thing, and I don't think I will need that uh, reflection, um, Angelica, that calls to your attention when you read a poem like Paul Lawrence Dunbar's We Wear the Mask, that um, it, it, when you interpret that poem, and, and I, I don't know, I've been retired for a while, but I have a sense based on what my grandson is bringing home to me, um, that we don't teach interpretation, we don't teach um, literature in, with any depth um, the way we used to, of course, when I was doing it, um, or when I was learning it in college, but what you could bring out le reading a poem like this is the fact that yes, it was written in 1896 when Plessy versus Ferguson had been passed. And that also it uh, harkens to um, W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folk, which if you have not read or do not know about, you should also put on your list because uh, he first wrote about double consciousness in 1896, and that was published in the Atlantic. So, you know, there are any number of layers that you can bring out when you look at a poem like this. But I, I, I sense, I fear that we do not. I fear that we do not because we don't know. And if we don't know, we don't learn, then we can never move forward. So you don't read Paul Lawrence Dunbar because nobody ever taught you Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And so when you go to college, you don't learn Paul Lawrence Dunbar. So therefore you can't teach Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I mean, it's like dominoes. So um, I think that's just about the end of my, of my commentary. Uh, and if you were to put it in a, in, a, in a sentence, it's we have to know our history. In order to move forward as a country, we have to know the history of the people who made this country. And the people who made this country look like me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. White, for following up Eric's history with, and the poetry is always a welcome uh, reminder of the culture and what is taught in schools. Um, we do actually have a question that rolls right into that, and it's from Ann Carter. She asked if uh, panelists could comment on the proposed legislation um, that's considering banning the New York Times 1619 project in Iowa schools. So any thoughts on that? Um, yes, please? I'll, take, I'll take that. I Thank was going to say, I won't, be, I won't be able to get a word in because Eric will take it. Take it away. <laughs> uh, I, I need to turn this little this light on here so you can kind of see my face. Uh, I think, well, first off, Sister Nicole Hannah-Jones was the first lecturer 
with for the University of Iowa lecture series uh, this fall. And uh, I had my camera, the cameras are off, we had to be, and uh, sound muted. And my throat was raw with excitement. I, I loved it. And I, I, there are so many things before she even opened her mouth that made that amazing. The project notwithstanding, but this is a confident, intelligent, strong-willed, strong-minded, powerful, very direct black woman who turned conservative Hillside College, Heritage Foundation, and any other wannabe organization on its face and said, I'm tired of this monolithic approach to public education. I am going to write this reality that every publishing company chooses to delete from the book. It's not just Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and then there was some slavery, but then there was freedom, and then Barack. That, that, that's, come on, give me a break with that crap. And, it, and you can't say, we're not racist. We voted for him twice. Yeah, fantastic. I've eaten eggplant twice. That doesn't mean I like it. And the 1619 Project is straight fact. And the problem with that is that the institution that created this country still has a lineage. My father and I were talking about the Skull and Bone Society, the, 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 all that Ivy League brotherhood, the community, that stuff that those sweater vests and bow ties with the leather patches on their elbows talking to one another. Bush the Prescott to George Herbert to George W. John Kerry. Yeah, Barack, but he was the first biracial young, uh, the Harvard Law Review president. Okay, we have to be specific. And for the 1619 Project to be suggested in Des Moines as illegal in not only public school, but universities, consider who suggested it. Consider who, who replaced the grand wizard Steve King from way out west and consider who the current governor is. And I say that figuratively. Cons when you consider all those players and yeah, well, he's really animated. He's really telling like, well, I'm not telling it like anything is. I just have lived too much, failed so much and read too much to care if somebody gets offended, if I say, hey, you know, black folks have been beaten and the only reason why you're upset is because now it's on camera. That's been happening since 1607. That's been happening since 1974. You thought the Capitol was bad, how about Watts? You thought it was bad when Rodney King was getting beaten. How about OJ? I mean, I don't need to rattle off that list. And the 1619 Project does something that I would love every person who's a believer in the truth, not the Fox News Channel truth, not the MSNBC truth, not the fifth column truth. What actually happened in this country and the backs that this country was built on and the blood that is in the soil in South Carolina, in Mississippi, in Illinois, in Dakota, whether North or South, all Nicole Hannah Jones did, she took a mirror and turned it on yourself and people don't like what they see. And the person you need to respect is the person you look at in the mirror every day. The problem is Nicole Hannah-Jones loves who she sees. Newt Gingras doesn't. Rudy Giuliani doesn't. That current occupant or the former occupant doesn't. That's why with all their power of the pen, they belittle, they demean, they degrade because that's not, I didn't, George Washington did cut down that cherry tree. And George Washington said he could not tell a lie. And Abraham Lincoln was the great emancipator. Abraham Lincoln was also the president who said to a congression of black, freed black Americans in the Oval Office, look out there. He points out the window and says, our boys are fighting over you and they do not know why. Why don't you go back to Africa? You thought Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were the first two that said that? Uh-uh, the great emancipator on the penny. Abraham Lincoln told black men, why don't you go back to Africa? Monrovia wasn't just a cool name settled on by a bunch of people on the continent. You see what I'm saying? 1619 is just real history. That's a buzzword. 1619 means people who watch to the right run away. You tie that to communism and socialism and fascism, which are three different definitions. It doesn't matter. As long as somebody that you believe in says that and you should be afraid of it, that's why that is the way that is and nothing more. There's no competency in that delivery. 
There's no education in that delivery. Nicole Hannah Jones, there's education in that delivery. You know, and she stares in the face people who threatened her mother with death. Her mother's home in Waterloo has been threatened to be burned countless times. She can't be public with herself due to the death threats. There are norm the numerous interviews that she's given about that. In conclusion, 1619 should be taught because it's real. Comment over. Thank you so much, Eric. I am in complete agreement with you, of course. I couldn't imagine working for the Civil Rights Commission and not believing that that project um, should not be taught. So absolutely. Uh, one more question. Um, we have and a may, if I could just step in, yeah, I'm not going to I'm not going to go on like Eric does, but I would just say that as um, as voting Americans uh, who ostensibly have some say in what is passed, we should not stand for that. We should not stand for that. The uh, the it, if you look at who has um, indicated that the six, there's something wrong with the 1619 project, it starts with Donald Trump and it moves down through each state's governor who pays homage to him. And regrettably, our governor is one of those people. So, and, and you can look it up. So, um, so I think that whoever asked that question and, and the rest of us should let our voices be heard. End of comment. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. White. I like how you are closing with that. That makes it good so I don't like cut anybody off. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I got to give the credit to Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. Oh, <laughs> okay. When he, when he introduced the, the art show, he's like, shut up and look at me. And then when he got done talking, he's like, come in over. And then he, he, he just, so I just figured I'm going to steal that because it's, it, it's, it's literally my comment is over. And then that's It's it. very functional. <laughs> Ron Swanson. Okay, the next question that we have coming in is, um, they're saying, you know, that a lot of great programs in our community for children. Um, are there programs focused on um, parents and guardians who are at a disadvantage or who needs additional support? Well, I can just say, um, and then I, I'm sure John has something to add. Um, I would just say that in terms of our program, which is a small program, granted, uh, parents have play an integral role in every uh, aspect of it. We have the Academy Expansion, which is for elementary school students. We have the AAAP program, African-American Awareness Program, which is in middle school, and we have the Academy. And all of those programs require a parent, uh, parent involvement. Uh, we, we also have a brand new program called Critical Conversations, which really came out of a need for adult, maybe not parents, but adults, most of whom are parents, um, to know what we're teaching our children. We're teaching kids in the academy to um, know their history and to be curious about it and to become good students because they know it. But sometimes when they go home, you know, they're talking to people who don't know anything about what they're learning. And so we decided to in initiate this program called Critical Conversations. I wanted to call it African American History for White People, but I was shot down. So we now call it Critical Conversations. Um, but we talk about all of the things that Eric alluded to in depth, and anyone can come to that those sessions, which are on Wednesdays at seven. And so in that way, parents, whether they be, I mean, adults, whether they be parents or not, can get information regarding African-American culture, literature, um, and what have you um, in 90 minute segments over time. On Wednesday, um, Eric will be talking about Miles Davis jazz, the true American music art form. So you're welcome to, to, uh, to come. Go ahead, John. I would add, um, there's, there's a, you know, in all sincerity, 
uh, Angelica and United Way would be a great resource because when you're asking that question, there are so many different organizations that do so many great things for families. Again, I, I, I'm not just PR in this because he's a good friend, but Alejandro Pino and what they're doing at YPN and, and the ways they're reaching families of real need. Um, in all sincerity, I don't know many organizations um, that are doing it as well as they are and for the various groups that they do it for. So it's, it's you know, um, it, it's a wide variety, but, but Angelica, you probably could answer that a lot better than I could. I mean, in all sincerity, we're like uh, Dr. White, uh, our program, our parents are very important to us. We have a family component, but you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say when you're a boys and girls club, uh, but yes, it's very important that they're involved in what we're doing and we make sure that they're doing the right stuff. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of great programs out there, folks. A lot of great programs. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that um, information. And I know the, the, the group does as well. Um, another question that has come in is it's a two-parter. So um, be aware of that. Um, do you have thoughts on how we can help young people who have fallen behind academically during the pandemic have success? And what can we do as a community to support that effort? And I will um, place that in the chat as well. But anyone who is um, willing and able. There, there is a lot that goes into that answer and I'm, it won't come from me. But it comes, you can start one, if one should start with the realization that healthcare, healthcare in this country blows. I, I'm sorry, I, I could find a thesaurus word, but that's the one I could come up with. And it's ridiculous that of the price of, of prescriptions, hospital stays, you know, uh, senior citizen homes, which shouldn't be allowed, by the way, because Americans treat the elderly horribly in this country, present company excluded. Uh, but what COVID has done, and we'll see if it has staying power. COVID has done two things. COVID has proven that what those liberal bastions of propaganda, the New York Times, the Washington Post, right, the Boston Tribune, all these papers, the LA Times, they've been reporting on this since Jack Anderson was writing for the Washington Post, since Walter Cronkite was at CBS News. Healthcare in this country, particularly in the communities, and let's be specific, not the communities of color, don't paint with that broad brush. That that makes you, that makes one, phew, I'm safe, and no one's going to think I'm racist if I just say communities of color, then you're talking about all the colors. I'll be very specific. Black Americans, Black Americans who happen to have brown skin and then brown skin that just happens to be biracial or lighter than that. That's, let's call it what it is. COVID has exacerbated the poor health environment of, for example, the city of Milwaukee and Macomb County in Georgia. So for Stacey Abrams to do what she did, side note, that's Herculean. To that end, it has also shined a light on that which people refuse to accept is what Dr. White referred to and is what John has spoken about history. Why are communities the way they are? Why is there a school? Why is there a pipeline to prison? And you can look, and I, this may sound difficult, <sighs> pardon, special education programs. I'll speak for black students. Emotion. If a black young girl is, look, she's got a bad attitude. We need to sit her, uh, segregate her from the rest of the room because she's got a bad attitude and she needs to learn the way we do things here. If it's a black boy, bounce him to the rubber room. He's got anger management issues. That absolves that general education teacher of having to do what? Listen, send an email, make a phone call, schedule a meeting and not at 9.30 a.m when Pilates just ended, okay? When PTA normally has their meetings between nine and 11. If you have to work to pay the bills, you can't go to that. But if you have a 5 p.m. or a 6 p.m. or you literally do what you're asked to do, contact the parent or the parents or the guardian, you talk to them. Look, insert student, he, he, he wild out today. Can we talk? I'd like to learn more. Maybe they have an IEP folder, look at that. Learn who your young futures future residents are in that room. COVID has exacerbated 
issues. And so when you start two laps behind, unless those that are two laps ahead of you stop, you will never catch up. You never will. COVID has exacerbated. So who was behind on a regular school day will be doubly behind, especially if there are more children in the home that attend different schools. And if there's only one laptop, maybe, or two. Okay, childcare has to be taken into consideration. Maybe the lack of childcare has to be, I mean, there are so many variables here to help. There's a, I know this district has a volunteer program that is you fill out a background check and be availed to volunteer for school. When and if it ever comes back to 20, uh, 365, 24 seven school, become a volunteer in the community. Be willing to, if your skin is different than the people with whom you work, be ready when you go home to your neighborhood to have a conversation with your friend who said, hey, what are you going down there for? Well, wh wh why'd you go there? And then you look them dead in the face and you say, because it's a Cedar Rapids community school district, not the Cedar Rapids, this block district. If you do that, you may lose friends, but then you didn't need them anyway, because you actually give a rip about the future of this city. And not just because you're, you may have to vote on a silo. You care. The community is uplifted when every young person is uplifted and invested in. Uh, comment over. I'll take a little different tone. Um, in all sincerity, people probably aren't going to like to hear this, but I would deeply consider going to year round schooling to catch up. I agree with her. I'm not, there's no easy fix with this, folks. Uh, it's going to take a long time, and we know studies show that that, time, that far uh, amount of time during the summer anyway already causes summer learning loss and, and problems of that sort. Uh, you know, in all sincerity, it may be a, a looking at how do we get kids to go to school year-round and try to catch them up because, you know, it, it, this is, this has been devastating to the education of kids and the reality is you can't just get it back. It's gotta be time, talent, effort put in by everybody uh, because it, I will echo, I think Eric, you were saying this too, but but this is not just a, a, a uh, African-American problem. I mean, for kids in general, uh, this loss we've experienced is, is going to be devastating to them. So you may have to take some really devastating uh, uh, moves forward and, and it may be year round schooling. Yeah, I agree um, that that may be the best idea. I think that the pandemic has, if there's a, a silver lining around this cloud, is that it has revealed things that would never have been revealed w without it. And uh, uh, kids, well, I was going to say kids, especially in elementary school, but I, it, it's high school, it's throughout the, the district, um, have lost time, they've lost motivation, they don't have the, the, the technology, the technology doesn't work. Um, it, it's really a very dire situation. And I'm not sure, I, I don't know, maybe there's somebody on here who works um, at the district at that level. Um, I don't know what's being done about it, but I do know that there are uh, myriad issues. And as John says, it's not a race issue here. Um, black kids are, are being damaged. Black kids are suffering. Um, but it's 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 something that impacts all of our kids. So maybe it, maybe year-round school is the answer. I, I would add this. A good friend of mine uh, in Des Moines said that uh, he, he saw that 60% uh, of the kids in a Des Moines school district are failing right now. 30% have not even checked in one time through uh, the virtual programming. And so it, don't get me wrong, I, I don't wanna paint a picture that it's clearly in, in economically disadvantaged and minority families, especially it's far, it's been worse and I know that. So I don't wanna paint that picture. I'm just saying that it is cutting across all barriers. This is, this is a tough education situation and we may have to make real tough decisions uh, because I don't know how you get it back. I just don't. 
unless you make really tough decisions. Well, it's something that just has to be confronted. You know, uh, James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And so here we are, you know, we really just have to look this in the face and look in, in the eye and make the hard decisions. And I think that, I hope that's what's going to happen. Thank you guys all so much for your thoughtful responses. And I'm not sure if our participants saw in the chat box, but Stephanie did mention that um, we'll extend this for a bit um, to try to answer a couple of more questions. Um, anybody can continue to stay. Um, and so hopefully that's okay with you, John, Eric, and Dr. White. Um, it seems like we have a lot of questions. One of the ones that seems to be very timely um, is the topic of school vouchers. So it seems like the that um, legislation is going to be, and it looks like Dr. Ruth. <laughs> um, so clearly- I gotta go, moving. Angelica, sorry. <laughs> no, you're-, you're <laughs> No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you're trying to get out of it, aren't you? <laughs> seems to be moving pretty quickly, and there's a lot of conversation about how that's going to impact the public school system. But I think more importantly, we're interested in knowing how that may impact our minoritized or oppressed communities within the public school system as well. So the short question is, how will school vouchers affect um, equity in education? Badly. Uh, I saw, I heard the end of a, of a program on um, NPR the other day, and uh, they, the, it was local, I forget which program it is that does the local uh, commentary, but they were talking about vouchers, and what I heard at the end was a question about uh, whether or not the legislator who was being interviewed thought that vouchers would impact the um, uh, diversity in minority communities. And he said, um, well, nobody is in favor of uh, impact negatively impacting diversity, but the, the choice of where a child goes to school has to be with his parents. And if the school doesn't fit, I love the use of that word fit, then the parent should have the right, I love the use of the word right, to choose for the child. And I say balderdash. I say it's um, a thinly veiled um, attempt to pull money from schools that have high minority populations and give people sanctions and permissions to go to homeschooling or go to private schools or go to uh, parochial schools for the expressed reason, and here we get back to the mask again, of not having to interact with uh, diverse populations. If you want a, if you don't already have literal examples of what Dr. White speaks, the podcast "Nice White Parents" from the New York Times will is exactly of is like what she's talking about. Exactly. It's interesting to hear these in these the interviews about when it comes you know when it comes like into your neighborhood the voucher discussion the charter discussion. Let's create a steam academy. Let's create a charter academy, and that's all veil. Those are all thinly veiled references for what they actually really do want to say. That's a great podcast. I think it's seven or eight episodes, but it's a uh, it's, it's worth a listen. So what should happen if this goes through is that all of the black people, all the minority people should get together and pull their kids out of the schools and start a charter school for black kids and see how the, the, um, the academic um, the rates improve and kids stop acting up and misbehaving and just be a miracle. That's what should happen, but it can't happen here because there aren't enough black people. It could happen in Atlanta or someplace like that. Thank you so much, everyone. I believe we caught all the questions. I'm trying to scroll through the chat box, but if I missed one, please go ahead and drop it into that chat box again. Um, so we'll just give a few minutes. I will uh, wanted to share with you guys, just because we are a little short on time, um, our outro for today or our um, sort of 30 second commercial for next week is 
Uh, next Tuesday, then at the same time, our focus is going to be on equity and financial stability. And we'll have Kelsey Bed Bedwell with Horizons, Paula Land with the Catherine McCulley Center, and Dean Rushing with the Willis Dady Homeless Services. Those conversations then are going to focus on financial stability and the intersection of poverty, privilege, and opportunity. We are going to be doing a poverty simulation worksheet as part of that exercise and discussing general generational wealth as well. And yeah, Stephanie, I will pass it along to you. Perfect. Yes, I was scrolling through to make sure, but I think we did catch all the questions. But again, uh, thank you so much to the speakers tonight, Dr. White, Eric, and John. As always, your expertise and your passion are um, so, so needed. So thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for all of the participants who took time out of your evening um, to come tonight and listen and um, ask wonderful and meaningful questions. Um, as Angelica said, we look forward to seeing you next week uh, as um, we move forward in these equitable conversations and hope to build that community in which everybody feels like they belong. And we, for logistic wise, we are recording this and we'll share that out. Um, but if you have any questions that come between now and the next week, feel free to shoot that to myself or Angelica, and we can present those to the speakers and um, get that information back to you. But again, thank you so much um, for your time, and please stay safe and stay warm. I did want to put a quick plug in for our last session, uh, Tuesday, I believe, February 23rd. Um, is going to be an opportunity for us to discuss next steps. And so each of these sessions are standalones if you're unable to attend the others, um, but do want to participate at the very end, we highly encourage you to do so. And we'll have some uh, deeper conversations among our participants and our guests um, about public policy changes and some different um, tangible things that you can do as far as um, voting and, um, you know, we talked a lot about what are some things that we can do to make sure that year round school is a possibility. So we'll have some of those conversations at the end of this series. Um, again, thank you guys all so much for spending your Tuesday evening with us and we look forward to seeing you next week. Can I just say one other thing, um, Angelica? Um, I forgot, well, I forget a lot, but I forgot to, uh, the, to include the book list um, in my slides. And so if anybody wants my, I put an abbreviated book list together so that if you really, somebody had a question about where the bottom is, if you really want to start at the beginning to, to learn about this information, um, there is a list of 10 books, all nonfiction, which is not like me, um, that is available. And so I think Angelica can, can, Angelica can share it out with you if you are interested. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. Yes. And there is um, a book list also on the Civil Rights Commission page, uh, a list of different resources around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And we'll share that out to all of those who participated tonight. So thank you. We also popped in the flyer for the Equity Conversation Series into the chat so you can just see um, specific speakers coming up and if you have questions. But again, thank you. Um, thank you so much. It's, it was heartening to see so many faces tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night, everybody.